In 1997, two years after a series of unsolved kidnappings and sexual assaults in California, one of the victims suddenly recalled an important detail of the crime she never told police. She left some forensic evidence in the assailant's vehicle. Evidence that left quite an impression. Nestled at the base of the magnificent Sierra Nevada range, Visalia, California received unwanted publicity in 1995. A serial rapist was stalking young women, sometimes striking in broad daylight. All of the descriptions of the assailant were similar, but not identical. This woman was the first victim whom we'll call Maria. I was 16 years old trying to keep up my grades and do good in school. On July 14, 1995, as Maria was about to walk into her apartment, she stayed outside for a moment to smoke a cigarette. Just as she lit the match, a stranger appeared. He pointed a gun at her, ordered her to get into the vehicle, um, told her if she did not, he would kill her. The man admitted being high on methamphetamines. He drove her to a deserted field, assaulted her, then let her go. At the hospital, a rape test kit did not recover any biological material suitable for DNA testing. Maria described her attacker as a young white male with curly hair about six feet tall. His weapon was a semi-automatic pistol. That face never leaves your mind. Never. You just feel sad, betrayed, hurt, angry. You get mad. You just go through a lot of pain. Maria said the assailant drove a blue or gray pickup truck. Police found a tire impression near the crime scene. They photographed it and made a mold of the impression. Ten days later, there was another incident. A 33-year-old woman parked in the local shopping center was accosted by a young white male in a white Ford Bronco. Hand over your purse, now. I'm gonna enjoy giving it to you. Oh, you creep! She challenged him verbally, and he fled. Two weeks later, a college girl was stopped by a man in a blue Thunderbird asking for directions. I'm looking for Esplanada Street. Could you get in and help me? I don't think so. But the girl was suspicious and ran away. Later that morning, the same man stopped a young woman we'll call Anne. Could you tell me how to get to Spinoza Street? All right, what you're going to do is you're going to go three long streets. Yeah, actually, would you mind getting in the car and just driving with me? Show me. Uh, I'm sorry. Anne agreed to show him where to go. Okay. To look at him, he was the type of guy who you could imagine luring the girls in the park because he looked relatively clean cut, was relatively soft spoken. Uh, he had a nice vehicle. Along the way, he stopped behind a dairy barn saying he needed to get some fresh air. Anne noticed drug paraphernalia and pornographic material in the back seat. The pornography depicted degradation and violence towards women. Now, fearing for her safety, she decided to run away. When she opened the door, the man put a gun to her head. He tied her hands, hit her in the head, and assaulted her. Eventually, he allowed her to go. 
and she ran over a mile and a half for help. This is 911. Do you have an emergency? Well, I is that a girl came here back and somebody had done things to her. She's still here at the house. Okay, she showed up naked? Yes. Anne described the assault as particularly demeaning. He just proceeded to sit. And while he was doing that, he said he hated girls. They were nothing but bitches. And he told me that I was a bitch. He just called me a bitch. And he was hitting me while he was doing it. This guy was particularly brutal, particularly demeaning to the women that he was assaulting. And that was consistent with all three of the cases. At the crime scene, police found shoe impressions, possibly those of the assailant. Anne said the weapon was a semi-automatic pistol, the same type of gun used in Maria's assault. The victims each described the attacker's physical appearance differently. And if it was the same man, police questioned why he drove a different vehicle to each crime. Detectives in Visalia, California were investigating four separate incidents involving attempted kidnapping, robbery, and sexual assault. In each case, the perpetrator was described as a tall, young, white male carrying a semi-automatic pistol. He left little forensic evidence behind, a shoe impression at one crime scene and some tire impressions at another. But the vehicles were different, and the victims gave different descriptions of the assailant, raising questions about whether it was the same man. There was a discrepancy in the height, which often occurs when you're attempting to describe an assailant who has just sexually assaulted and abused you at gunpoint. Um, there was also some issues with regard to describing the suspect's hair, his hair length. The first break in the case occurred when police in Fresno, California, about an hour's drive away, arrested a man they suspected of committing similar crimes there. We found out that a similarly described suspect with a similar vehicle had attempted two separate uh, kidnapping incidents up in their city. Um, later in the day, actually the same day that uh, our victim here in town was confronted. I'm gonna give you several pictures. To see if this was the same man assaulting women in Visalia, police showed the victim, Maria, a photographic lineup that included the Fresno suspect. But Maria could not identify any of the men. It's not these guys. Next, police showed the lineup to Anne. Yeah, that's him. I'm pretty sure that that's him. We placed that photo lineup in front of uh, our one victim, and she positively identified him. Now, Vesalia police were convinced they had their man. But there was a problem. In their initial interviews with police, both Maria and Anne described their attacker as having very little chest hair. The Fresno suspect had a lot of chest hair and his shoe size did not match the shoe impression found at the crime scene. Police doubted the Fresno man was their perpetrator. Their suspicions were confirmed a few days later when the crimes in Visalia started all over again. A white male in a blue Thunderbird approached a 14-year-old girl and her six-year-old sister at an intersection and tried to coax them into his car. When they refused, he sped off. A few hours later, police saw a blue Thunderbird in a convenience store parking lot. The driver matched the description given by the two girls. He was 20-year-old Chad Melvin Mancebo, the son of a prominent local dairy farmer. He was married, had no criminal record, but police found methamphetamines in his car. The M.O. of his attacks on these women were indicative of someone who was using methamphetamine or crank pretty heavily. He was very aggressive. He was very demeaning and um, just very brutal with the women. It's 
and it's consistent, in my experience, with someone who's a chronic user of methamphetamine. I know you've done this before, Maria. I need you to take a look. In a photographic lineup, Maria positively identified Mancibo as the man who assaulted her. She was visibly shaken. She began crying, as I recall, and was quite, obviously quite upset, and I'm sure I brought back the memories of that day when she was, in fact, kidnapped and brutally raped. But Maria said her assailant's vehicle was a pickup truck, not a sedan. Police found no evidence Mancibo had ever owned a pickup truck. Yeah, I also had uh, my agency check for vehicles that were, had been stolen in the last month, matching that description as well, and everything came back negative. I couldn't get a lead on anything. In Mancibo's home, police found a pair of tennis shoes. When forensic analysts compared Mancibo's shoes to the footwear impressions found at one of the crime scenes, the results were inconclusive. Anne also identified Mancibo as her assailant from a photographic lineup, but she had identified another man just a few weeks earlier. Sure. Because of these inconsistencies, prosecutors wanted more than just eyewitness identification. They were hoping for scientific evidence. On the strength of the eyewitness identifications, 20-year-old Chad Mancibo was arrested for the kidnapping and sexual assault of Anne and Maria. What was so horrific about the case was that um, it involved such horrendous acts of violence, forcible rape and robbery, kidnap at gunpoint. To prosecutors, it appeared that Mancibo was relatively unconcerned about the charges. He was completely self-absorbed. He was in a lot of trouble, and he just couldn't understand why mom and dad couldn't bail him out of this. And he repeatedly asked for mom and dad to be able to come down and, and take him home. And he thought he was, he just thought they could get him out of this. The problem facing prosecutors was that one of the victims had previously identified someone else. Our memories are actually not accurate at all. And victims, at the time of a crime, most victims are victims at nighttime, when it's dark out. So you already have a visual disadvantage. We also know that your eyesight actually diminishes in when you're in a panic situation, when you're afraid. Yeah, that's it. And so when the victim says, that's the man, and they're unequivocal that did this to me, they're probably wrong. With no forensic evidence, prosecutors knew that Mancibo's defense attorney would challenge the victim's identification. As Mancibo awaited trial, investigators interviewed his wife. Despite the circumstances, she tried to be helpful. She was pregnant with their first child at that time, and she knew that he had a had been abusing methamphetamine. She knew that he had some bizarre sexual appetites uh, that became worse when he was using methamphetamine. Um, but I don't think she suspected he was involved in these things. The Mancibo's home was located on his parents' dairy farm, which had a number of different vehicles. A search of the California Motor Vehicles database confirmed that Chad Mancibo did not own a blue or silver pickup truck that Maria described. But his father once did, and recently sold it. Police located the vehicle 60 miles away. This is the police videotape of Maria examining that vehicle. She said it was similar to the one she remembered, but wasn't sure it was the same one. The new owner had made a number of repairs and improvements. So the headliner in this vehicle is different. Suddenly, Maria remembered an important detail she had completely forgotten. I remember I did it too. 
And it was at that point that she recalled while she was being sexually assaulted outside the driver's side door as the defendant had her bent over, she bit down on the weather stripping. I wanted to leave something behind, some type of evidence, teeth marks, scratch marks, something. I scratched the inside of the truck and I bit down on the black piece of the, the door by the window. I bit down really hard to try to leave some type of teeth mark to identify. To police, the marks on the black weather stripping appeared to be just wear and tear, but Maria insisted it was evidence. The two-foot piece of black rubber was carefully removed from the driver's side window and sent to forensic odontologist Dr. Norman Sperber. During his 40-year career, Dr. Sperber has examined bite impressions in a number of items found at crime scenes. I've seen them in apples, I've seen them in cheese, I've seen it in um, sandwiches, and never before, however, on weather stripping. I'd never seen that before. Although it had been nearly two years since those bite marks were made, the elasticity of the rubber retained the imprints in their original form. And all of a sudden, I could see four small rectangles, which I knew represented the lower front teeth. Dr. Sperber marked the indentations with small dots. Next, Maria's teeth were set in a kelp alginate material to make a model of her teeth. When Dr. Sperber compared Maria's dental impressions to the bite marks in the weather stripping, he discovered a clear match. On the weather stripping, I noticed that uh, one of the teeth was sticking out, the right front tooth. The victim's teeth, I noticed the same tooth, that right front tooth is sticking out. Every tooth just fit precisely. I'd never really seen a match quite so good on an uh, inanimate object before. Despite the fact that two years had passed, despite the alterations to the car made by the new owner, police could now prove Maria had been inside that vehicle. It was not a crime about sex. It had to do with violence. The defendant's hatred for women, the things that he said to both of these girls during the commission of the sexual assault. He said he hated girls. They were nothing but bitches. And he was hitting me while he was doing it. When police searched Chad Mancibo's home, they discovered even more incriminating evidence. They found the pornographic videotapes and reported seeing in Mancibo's car. And police also found ammunition for a 380 gauge semi-automatic pistol. When Chad Mancibo went on trial for the kidnapping and sexual assault of both Maria and Anne, prosecutors portrayed him as extremely dangerous, a man without guilt or conscience. He didn't care who he had to hurt to get what he wanted. Like I say, he's a hedonistic, self-absorbed little brat. As expected, the defense challenged Anne's identification of Mancibo since she had initially identified another man. Although there was very little forensic evidence, what they had was overwhelming. Maria's bite marks proved she had been inside the truck owned by the Mancibo family, a vehicle that Chad often borrowed. After explaining my conclusions under direct examination by the prosecutor, I remember being uh, very surprised that there was very little questions and very little time spent by the defense in uh, cross-examination on me. And I assumed it was because the uh, evidence was so um, dynamic. The 16-year-old biting down on the weather stripping was what you would call the smoking gun in the case. 
essentially it prevented the defense from arguing that they had the wrong guy in that particular case. And the fact that she at the time was being sexually assaulted thought enough to bite down on the black rubber weather stripping and scratch the door area uh, is amazing. It's incredible that someone would think to do that. The jury found Chad Mancebo guilty of two counts of kidnapping, rape, and sexual assault. He was sentenced to 155 years in prison and won't be eligible for parole until he serves 133 years. It was a huge sense of relief that this sexual predator will never walk the streets again. He will never be able to do this to anyone else. He's a brutal user. Uh, if I'm convinced that given the opportunity, he would use again. He would use people again to get what he wants for his immediate pleasure. I wouldn't want my daughters around him. I wouldn't want your daughters around him. And I don't think any, uh, any caring parent would. Chad Mancebo's conviction has provided closure for Maria, who has since moved to San Antonio, Texas, to build a new life. Without her bite impressions in the rubber on that pickup truck, prosecutors might not have been able to make their case. The message that should be sent is, if this does ever happen to someone else, and they are being sexually assaulted, leave behind a piece of evidence, because that forensic evidence can absolutely be a crucial piece of evidence in a case. I didn't want anybody going through what I went through by him. And now I'm I, I'm satisfied with myself because I know that will never happen to anybody else by him.